Hi folks. Here I just want to introduce a few concepts and definitions relevant to a discussion of life's origins and evolution. It seems that there's no argument that there was a time on Earth before life existed. But before there were living things on Earth, the stage was being set for the appearance of life. In theological terms, this was the time before creation. In scientific terms, the prebiotic period was a time of chemical experimentation that eventually led to the emergence of the first cells. So what is life? Well, we define life best by listing its properties. Here I hope is a reminder of those properties. Evolution is uniquely a property of life, resulting in the adaptation of organisms to changing environmental conditions, and leading ultimately to the diversity of species. Life, of course, is cellular, taking place in a space surrounded by a semi-permeable membrane. We say that life is complex, but not complex like your computer motherboard. It's a dynamic complexity. Maybe it's more like your motherboard plugged in but in fact much more complex than anything humans have invented. Cells and organisms resist change in an environment that may be undergoing constant short-term changes. Your constant body temperature is a good example of this property of homeostasis. All living things use energy from external sources to fuel all cellular work, including the effort to maintain dynamic complexity and homeostasis, along with all other of life's properties. Cells and organisms respond to stimuli, that is to say, they are irritable. Cells and organisms grow, and they follow a program of development. This is most obvious in multi-celled organisms, but not unknown even among single-celled creatures. And of course, all living things reproduce, that is, they come from other living things. Note that I have given the property of evolution, call it pride of place, to emphasize that living things would not exist without the ability to evolve, any more than life could exist if any one of the other properties was missing. What then is the difference between the origin of life and evolution? The syllogism here should help answer this question. While prebiotic chemical events and changes during the prebiotic era are sometimes referred to as a period of chemical evolution, what we recognize and call true evolution is one of the properties of life, and therefore only begins after the origin of life. Here are the common features of how living things on Earth achieve life's properties. These commonalities are also what makes life on Earth unique. If we ever find life on other planets, the properties of that life are likely to be, of course, the same as ours. But the molecular mechanisms that achieve those properties are very likely to differ. We suggest that all life on Earth shares the following specific characteristics that might make it unique. So of course all life as we know it is cellular. Also, all life on Earth shares the same basic molecular mechanisms for reproducing and building new cells as shown here. All cells on Earth store information in nucleic acids, DNA in fact, and information flows in the same direction in all cells. Because this is a common feature of life, Francis Crick called it the central dogma. Information flows from DNA to RNA, that's transcription, and from RNA to protein, that's translation, and of course DNA replicates to reproduce itself. And there's more. Even the machinery of translation involving ribosomes and RNAs are essentially the same in all living things. Here's an animation of a process you might be familiar with. As proof that the machinery of translation is essentially the same in all living things, consider that ribosomes from bacteria can translate eukaryotic mRNAs under the right conditions into the same, that is to say, correct, proteins. We'll consider the origins of life in more detail in another presentation, but for now let's briefly acknowledge that there was a time on Earth before life and that physical and chemical conditions favored an origin of life at some time on our prebiotic Earth. So, somehow, life emerges under those physically and chemically permissive conditions. Evolution begins when the first cell starts reproducing. One of these cells is the progenote, the ancestor to all life on Earth. Evolution of the progenote must have produced different lineages of cells, 
but the cell that was to be the parent of the lineage that led to the spread of life on Earth would be our last universal common ancestor. The acronym is the LUCA. It was in the LUCA that the common characteristics of earthly life were finally established in such a way that they could not really be altered in all future generations. So evolution begins with reproduction, which involves the replication of genetic material. Okay, so what's a genome? A genome is all of the DNA in an organism or in a cell, including its genes. Evolution results when random changes, that is to say mutations in genes and genomes, generate a pool of raw material for natural selection. With each new generation, the imperfect replication of DNA provided and continues to provide a reservoir of genetic diversity. The genome harbors that pool of genetic diversity, those altered genes created by those random mutations. These are genes that did not harm the organism, but that could be tapped when environments change, leading to natural selection. It's pretty remarkable that Darwin intuited that natural selection would lead to descent with modification, even without understanding either Mendelian genetics or molecular genetics. Evolution then relies on, in fact requires, that there be imperfections of reproduction. So here's a cartoon of replication of double-stranded DNA. Should look familiar, I think. DNA strands separate and the complementary strands are replicated semi-conservatively. You may recall this. Mutations of DNA are in fact random events of DNA replication. They can include base substitutions, deletions, insertions of DNA, and other events. Here we model random base substitutions. The mutations can have one of several effects. They can be neutral, as I suggested before, that is to say, without any significant effect. Of course, they can also kill the organism, or they can make an organism immediately more fit to survive. Let's take a closer look at these consequences. Organisms with deleterious mutations are going to die or at least be less likely to reproduce. The environment selects offspring with beneficial mutations, but such mutations are rare. Instead, as neutral mutations accumulate, changing environmental conditions select individuals who, by chance, have a now useful trait in the pool of heretofore neutral mutations. To the extent that this mutation makes an individual more fit for new living conditions, that organism will reproduce and pass its traits on to future generations. Speciation, the hallmark of evolution, occurs when populations with different traits separate sufficiently from one another, producing new populations that can no longer interbreed. Early observations were that all organisms studied use similar ribosome-based machinery to synthesize proteins, as I showed you earlier. Thus, evolutionary biologists could conclude that these machines evolved shortly after the origin of life, if not sooner, even at a time of prebiotic chemical experimentation, and that there would be few, if any, exceptions to how proteins were made in cells. The availability of DNA sequences, even complete genomic sequences, from many species made it possible to compare sequences between them. And the comparison of the sequences of genes encoding, for example, the small ribosomal RNA subunit of numerous species, from bacteria to humans, reveal our common ancestry. Here's an example. The RNA molecule undergoes a base change, and then another, and in this case, finally, a third. Comparison of related genes look for the shortest path for base changes in their sequences to establish gene phylogenies like the one in the next slide. We know that we're descended from a single lineage of early cells, the LUCA. The most impressive evidence for this is that we share genes for a component of ribosomes, shown in this ribosomal RNA phylogenetic tree. Since there exists no cell or organism that we've ever found that translates genetic information in RNA into polypeptides in a different way, the LUCA must have already established a semblance of the ribosomal translational machinery that we find in all cells today. This simplified phylogeny, based on the same rRNA sequences, just emphasizes that living things are divisible into three genetically distinct domains of life. True bacteria, 
archaebacteria, and eukaryotes, all of which share the common ancestry of descent from the LUCA. The surprise was not only that we had to abandon earlier classification systems, but that based on genetic evidence, the archaebacteria, which look most like bacteria, were in fact more closely related to us eukaryotes than to the bacteria. This timeline can give us a sense of major evolutionary events across the eons. Evidence exists for life as long ago as 3.8 to over 4 billion years ago. Not so long, in fact, after the planet formed. We're going to leave a consideration of the evidence for this to another presentation. Okay, the take-home message here is that genetic and metabolic biochemistries found in cells today must have been established early on in the LUCA, and perhaps very early in the timeline. LUCA passed these successful characteristics on to us, while other cell lineages must have disappeared, gone extinct. The random genetic changes that were then selected during diversification and speciation were superimposed on that basic genetic and metabolic machinery that we inherited from the LUCA, tweaking but never drastically changing or reversing them. Many genome projects, both completed and underway, are now revealing new patterns of gene structure, organization, and regulation of expression that account for species differences. We'll see evidence for this in other presentations as well. And that brings us to an end of this presentation.